Chapter 6. The Soul as Image Soul. The Problem of Finding the Soul. Not things, but images are animated. This is the key to the whole theory of life. No natural science can possess it, because its reality is the merely derived world of imputed things, instead of the original world of visual images. If things as we have seen are impossibly animated, then the <coughs> images must be animated. We shall not repeat the proof for that, but summarise its results shortly. All things stand in a, quote, closed causal connection, end quote. Consequently, there is no interaction between them and the soul, because this would break the chain of causes and a fortiori, no parallelism, because this would destroy the connection between the two. In a world of things, causes and forces, souls have no room. Their home is the reality of images. Of proofs for this alone already sufficient is the one from the process of the soul finding. In the third chapter we have briefly considered the origin of the conviction of one's own being alive. However, we have not yet considered the origin of the existence and the nature of foreign life. The usual opinion is that one comes to the knowledge of foreign experience by transferring one's own to the world of appearance. We pass over the irrevocable self-contradictions into which one gets with it, and pick out only one circumstance at which it breaks. Transmissions of experiences, called empathies, undoubtedly occur constantly and can never be avoided completely. However, they are not the source of knowledge, but the most important source of deception. If, out of an elevated mood after a brilliantly passed examination, I find all the persons I meet looking more amused than usual, then I have indeed sensed my own pleasure in them. But precisely to that extent, I have also deceived myself about their real moods. Our question, however, was aimed at the source of our knowledge of the real nature of foreign souls, and not at our illusions about it. We would not even know about the existence of foreign persons, let alone how they were constituted, if our experience of the world appears, if our experience of the world appearance would not be directly and originally an experience of the appearance of living souls. Yes, without this, the name appearance would have no sense at all. For since neither the point to which we think the image characteristics and the unity of the thing are related, nor the concept of the thing, nor finally the setting mental act would be also to appear, it would lack the content which would appear. That what really appears in it are souls, which does not need to be proved to the primitive, but arouses the strongest doubts in the educated. We ourselves testify with numerous expressions, and consequently with that side of our experience, on which the ability to produce as well as to understand language is based. On the double meaning of sensual epithets. If the sensual characteristic, with the help of which we distinguish things, gives us the indication of what is experienced in the thing, then, in view of what has just been said, the epithet designating it should, in principle, have a double meaning. That of a feature of the appearance itself, and that of a feature in the being appearing in it, or taken from the difference in direction of the concepts. It should designate the characteristic both of a thing and also of a soul that appears in it. There are innumerable proofs for this. The human body has the property of warmth. A piece of ice has the property of cold. But also the colours of a painting are warm, of another cold. Rough is the bark of a tree, but rough also is the sound of a roaring bull, or the climate of the highlands of Pamir. Sharp is the knife, as no less the whistle of the locomotive and the smell of the vinegar. The property of sound and the property of colour have nothing at all in common with each other, and nevertheless we speak unhesitatingly of tone colours and colour tones. 
height characterizes the mountain, depth the well shaft according to the same characteristic, however the tone qualities differ from each other. If we speak of the difference of high and low tones, it certainly does not occur to anyone to think that the former float down from the stars and the latter up from the gullets of the earth. But how do we come to distinguish certain kinds of sounds by a contrast of the places in space whose sensual content is incomparably different from that of the visual space? It would be idle to refute the various erroneous views with which one tried to explain this. And only basically, it is to be noted, that the linguistic theory of transference, which is also popular here, can only satisfy the thoughtlessness. The language is teeming with genuine translations. Mountain back, table leg, lever arm, horse hay, flower cup, weathercock, seal are some examples. But how does the transfer come about, the result of which is, for example, the name mountain bag? Have we compared, whether consciously, whether unconsciously, the appearance of the animal and the appearance of the mountain with each other, and found a correspondence for the animal body part called back to the shape of the mountain due to a fleeting similarity of their total shapes? However familiar such coupling words may be to us, we nevertheless remain capable of assuring ourselves of the figurativeness at any time. We only have to pay attention to know immediately that the back of the mountain is only a back, the arm of the lever is only an arm, the belly of the pot is only a belly, so to speak. We find even without linguistic talent for each of them an immediately significant substitute. Mountain back, for example, is the rear of the mountain, or the upper edge or profile line. If on the other hand we were asked how a high tone differs from a low tone, we would either have to make the questioner hear two different high tones, or we would resort to paraphrases which would be in the same line as the one to be explained and would need no less an explanation. A high tone equals bright tone, equals pointed tone, equals light tone. Low tone equals dark tone, equals wide tone, equals heavy tone. The high tone is therefore by no means merely high, but it really is, and likewise, the rough sound is really rough, the warm colour really warm, the sharp smell really sharp. Not everyone has to notice the differences in question, but whoever noticed them does so just as immediately as he distinguishes loud from soft sounds or black and from white. All attempts of explanation are for now, and always, doomed to a hopeless failure. As long as one has not understood that the statements... On the one hand, the colour is red, and on the other hand, this very colour is warm, concern two different realities. The derived reality of the things, and the original reality of the images. When we distinguish certain peculiarities in the surface quality of things with the names of colours, so on the other hand peculiarities of the coloured appearing soul with statements like, one colour is warm, another cold, in the meaning of things, we can apply the names to the things themselves, and originally always do, a red, yellow, green thing. But in the meaning of the soul, we initially apply them only to the properties of the things, warm red, cold blue. Whether we now like to reify the properties again and add to them again characteristic epithets, we only need to compare with the warm red, for instance, the dark red, to notice immediately that the latter merely aims at the closer identification of the redness. The former, however, aims at the character of the redness. If, however, the same words designate both properties of things and characters of images, then the justifying impression must at the same time be the expression of a soul capable of appearing, with which the only conceivable source of all soul-finding would be determined. If, however, the same words designate both properties of things and characters of images, then the justifying impression must, at the same time, be the expression of a soul capable of appearing, with which the only conceivable source of all soul-finding would be determined. It is worthwhile to dwell for a moment on the high and low tones. 
Here the tones themselves are distinguished with names directly for tone characters, from which it is obvious that other peoples and other times prefer other property names. The ancient Greeks, for example, sharp and dull. It would be easy for us, but it would take us away from the main subject, to establish the character relationship of all of them with each other, and especially with the characters of the visual space. And only on this may still fall a glancing light. Why in the field of the tones, the designation of themselves, as it seems, was generally omitted. Compared to tactile and visible, and pro visible properties of things, noises and sounds, although no less impressionable, are, because of their fleetingness, much more difficult to relate to temporally stable documents, and remain just as much closer to the appearance as they adhere more loosely to things and seem to play only between them. Listening to the meaning of the words, we notice that the reification of the visible properties of things took place in the direction of materialization, of the audible ones in the direction of spiritualization. The colour can be compared to a thing, the sound only to a being. The application of badly characterising names to tones themselves results from their relatively thing-independent essence. On the sensual designation of human characters. Even the last doubt about the correctness of what has been said would be removed by the circumstances that we cannot communicate about processes, states, characteristics of human souls in any other way than with the help of names for sensual characteristics. From the usual abundance of examples for this, which the German language alone gives us, we bring only a few striking as possible. We bring only a few as striking as possible, and that in an order which runs without conceptual rigour from the most general to the more special characteristics of appearance. The space, its dimensions, its fullness, delusions of grandeur, boastful, great resolutions, small-minded, small-hearted, petty, high thoughts, lofty, high-minded, Low thoughts, humiliation, lowliness. Profound, depth of feeling, absorbed in thought. Wide horizon, broad-minded, far-seeing. Narrow height horizon, narrow-minded, limited. Long-sighted, short-sighted. Shallow, superficial. Mindful, soulful, witty, thoughtful. Openness, close-mindedness. Static and dynamic along with the results of movement. Movement of mind, calmness of mind, excitability, restlessness, agitated, mobile, distractible, effervescent, overflowing, bubbling, rash, hasty, flight of thought, exaltation, inspiration, devotion, inclination, aversion, restraint. Lifted. Depressed, pressed, grasped, stunned, captivated, entranced, overwhelmed, tense, strained, stretched, bent, stirred, shaken, mad, from moved from the right place to the wrong place, dislocated, twisted, bent, rubbed, sly, from compu completely infused with something, hidden, devious, disjointed, Tidy, ravished, from ravish meaning to snatch away, dismayed, from showered with something, fickleness. Materiality, weight, state of aggregation, malleability, heavy hearted, ponderousness, gravitas, heavy revolve, light blooded, frivolous, credulous, frivolity. Firmness, hardness, softness, impenetrability, stubbornness, wooden, massive, supple, pliable, tough, brittle, to imagine, to impress, impression, atmospheric, serenity, clarity, serene, enlightened, 
transfigured, gloom, gloominess, dry, stormy, fickle, with reference to ancient religious customs, to throw something to the wind, windbag, to fall out of the clouds, as if fallen from the moon, fire of passion, enthusiasm, fiery temperament, nature, burning love, ardent hatred, kindled, inflamed, inflammable, palpabilities and temperatures, gentle, rough, perceptive, blunt, pointed, heat, cold, cold-blooded, hot-blooded, frosty, chilly, icy, sense of taste, sweet love, bitter sorrow, bitterly evil, sour trouble, sense of smell, acoustics, tuning, tuned, out of tune, down tuned, voice of reason, conscience, reason from to hear, optics, view, insight, intention, perscapacity, blinded, enlightenment, bright head, intuition, activities and their results, drive, urge, to imagine, conception, concept, to grasp something, apprehension, approaching, rejecting, attracting, repelling, dissipating, engaging, from taking into oneself and thereby possessing, being bent on something, dissipating, discursive, from passing through, casting value, unbridled, saddle fast, uncouth, unpolished, unadorned, nailed, dogged, broad-minded, head-hanging, soft-spoken, hair-splitting. Each of the listed expressions has, in addition to its soul-specific meaning, a factual meaning that is either still alive today or that can be immediately visualized without difficulty, which is based on the experience of a reality that appears, and no one would be able to invent other names for the identification of human characters instead of names based on images. Either one shows us souls in exactly the same way as one shows us directly colours, shapes, movements, indirectly sounds, smells, temperatures, tastes, or one wants to reject as senseless the speech that lets the showable be transferred to the never and nowhere showable. From the descriptive basis of non-descriptive facts, Perhaps, however, we are reproached for having made a very biased selection, which can easily be counted by another such name which describes mental qualities without the mediation of sensual ones. E.g., no vividness is to be noted from words such as sorrow, grief, joy, anger, consciousness, spirit, mind, desire, soul. To this it would have to be replied that the same applies to them as to all conceivable names for non-descriptive facts although with many of them the figurative starting point of their roots and the development of the feelings of meaning has long faded away, and sometimes even linguistic science finds it difficult to determine it. The original meaning of sorrow, for example, is burden, strain, grief, proves to be originally related to the Greek chromados, crunching. Glad goes back to the Old Norse freer, fast, nimble. Anger is derived from the root ter, to tear, Old High German zeren, to tear. The knowledge and consciousness leads to the root wid, to see, to find. Greek, idean, Latin, verdere, widere. Soul comes from the ur-Germanic zaivolo, which is probably related to Greek Iolos, movable. Whenever we trace the history of such names sufficiently far back, we infallibly come across a sensual original meaning, and often find, even for today, meaning-related soul names that have the same or similar initial images among the most different peoples. Thus, to mention only obvious ones, the soul is conceived as breath in the Latin spiritus, Greek psyche, and noima. Slavic, 
Dwa, Indian Etman, and Prana, Arabic Nefs and Ru, Hebrew Nefesh and Ruach, as something blowing, shaking, excited in anima and animus. In Thymos, from Thyaean to Rush, possibly also in the German Geist, if the assumption of its origins from Old Norse Geyser is to rage is correct. The more the investigation spans far apart linguistic circles, the more compelling the descriptive basis of all naming in general reveals itself, and the connection of properties of the being with sensual qualities is revealed as being based on the definition of the former to be the appearance of the latter. If our scholars still continue to talk about transmissions, then they should consider, by the way, that not even the imagination of a storyteller could concoct something even more wonderful than scientific psychology. The science would find itself in the astonishing position of constantly using consciously transferred and inauthentic expressions, without, however, ever being able to tell us what it actually means. For whether it would use a hundred or even a thousand words to explain a single metaphor, each of them would again be a metaphor. Yes, the matter is only brought to an almost tragic comedy by the fact, which cannot be doubted, that among the linguistically available names for characters of life, the soul scientist disdains most of all, and must naturally really disdain those which, like mind or will or spirituality, no longer show their figurative origin. Mind, will, soul, spirit, spirituality seem to him dark and suspicious of hasty hypostases. He hopes to remain more sober if instead he speaks of mental processes, of inner movements, mental activities, or also of forces, energies, socializations, which are really associations, interweavings, fusions, or of tension, congestion, solution, or of field of view and point of view of attention or probably even of narrowness and wideness of consciousness of subliminal supraliminal ascending descending maintaining displacing fighting each other ideas not to mention the already quietly hinted hide and seek game of learning sounding the hide and seek game with learned sounding foreign words each of which is borrowed from the world of sense things. But what has he achieved with such frazzling? In the sense of his way of looking at things, just this, to describe the whole inwardness with the help of coarse-handed transmissions from the area of the senses, whereby he admittedly, in contrast to the colourful and sounding richness of the colloquial language, shows a decided preference for similes from mechanics. Difficile est satiram non scabere. It is difficult not to write a satire. We think that now no doubt remains. Colours, heat levels, spatial properties, etc. are only suitable for the description of soulful personalities because they are soulful themselves. It would be impossible and could not even be attempted to characterise souls with the help of the world appearance if it were not the souls and exclusively the souls which appear in the world. The reality, in itself, is a world of animated images or appearing souls. And if it would be different, then nobody would ever have announced what moved his own soul, because there would have been nobody to whom the message could have reached. At this point we anticipate a finding of the highest importance. To be explained further below, with which we contrast with the entire psychology of modern times. Even if its most cautious representatives recognise that the act of perception must be added to the experience of impression, so that what is experienced becomes the object of perception, none of them has yet explored and properly understood the experience of impression itself. Caught up in the English false doctrine of a sensation, divided into five parts, one has not only misjudged the nature of real sensation, which we will discuss later, but also completely overlooked the fact that all sensual experience processes another side that is different in nature from it. 
namely together with the experience of dreaming, the side of seeing, through which the experience of impressions enables us to relate what we experience to things. This cannot possibly be the same process through which it compels us, and even more originally, to relate it to beings. If the above happens, as we will show, by means of sensation, then it happens with the help of perception, which is related to it. He who feels something hard and something soft experiences at the same time, with the same originality, the difference of the character of both. But if the character of hardness and the character of softness can also be experienced where there is nothing to touch, then it cannot have been the genuine process of sensation of touching, and so it must rather have been the process of seeing through which the perception of being was mediated. Because of the sensation, the animated spirit bearer perceives animated things, souls appearing because of his seeing. We add, the seeing can happen without sensation, as already the state of dreaming proves. The sensation, however, needs the supporting seeing, so that the sensed can be noticed, and about which will be more detailed below. What lives in the so-called living things? We spoke so far of the life of the images, thus of the original reality, and consequently of the life of the universe. For we must not, of course, distinguish between living and non-living things. Will it be understood rightly if we add, appearances are alive without exception. Things are inanimate without exception. Taken as tangible images, not only plants, animals and human beings live, but also rock, cloud, water, wind and flame. The sun dust, the brick, the desk, the starry sky, even space and time live. Taken in the sense of only conceivable things, even the human being is like all other things, only a union of mechanically moved atoms. We will make our opinion clearest with the help of the undoubted difference which exists between the life of the corporeality of the dead and the living animal, the dead and the living plant. But this is how this difference presents itself to us. In the wood of the living tree, the life of the tree itself appears. The logs of the decomposed tree, on the other hand, are a partial expression of the life of the earth. So we distinguish the life of the macrocosm from the life of the microcosm, and our question about the so-called origin of life on Earth is not how did dead matter become a living plasma, but it is how did the life of the Earth become cell life? The most convincing revelator of late romantic knowledge in his beautiful book on the life of the Earth, Carl Gustav Karos, says, in everything organic, limb-like, is the same life existing in perpetual development of some individuality is to be recognised. No matter whether we are talking about emerging solar systems or of a developing plant, and no less belonging to a larger organism to be called the rock with its crystalline joints or the spring with its rhythmic currents in relation to the whole of the earth, than the bone structure with its crystal fibres, or the bloodstream with its pulsating wave beat in relation to the life of the animal. Both kinds of life, the macrocosmic and the microcosmic, comprise again numerous subtypes, which, however, are not to be discussed further here. On the other hand, we have to prove the doctrine of the life of images, which we have proved so far only on the image of the world itself also on that side of the image of the world, which in the spirit of mechanistics would fall under the genus of living things, on the living organisms in the narrower sense. For this purpose, we limit ourselves to a single characteristic of the so-called living thing, the distinctive value of which has never been disputed, the characteristic of reproductivity. Not dust, stone, water, cloud, but every living cell reproduces from mating or by division. 
Everything that lives today is consequently connected with the very first protoplasms which have originated on Earth millions of years ago. Every living being of the present is connected by an unbroken chain with the living beings of an unthinkable prehistoric time. Let us consider the facts a little more exactly. A beech tree falls from the beech tree and grows into a new tree on the forest floor. Does the mother beech now live on in the beech child? Certainly not. The former can be cut down and burn, the latter continues to grow happily. Or does something of the substance of the old beech live in the renewed one? Well, likewise not, because the fully grown young tree also does not hold one atom more of the matter of the fruit from which it grew. The matter of a man of 30 years has been changed up to the last molecular units compared with the matter of the same man of 10 years. But if neither the intrinsic being is preserved, nor also the substance of which it consists, what is it actually that reaches through thousands and thousands of generations uninterruptedly? The only possible answer is an image. The image of the oak. The image of the pine. The image of the fish. The image of the dog. The image of the human being returns in every single carrier of the species. Reproductivity is the physically eternally inaccessible process of the passing on of the archetype of the species from place to place and from time to time. Not the matter lives, but the image that moves from body to body in the cycle of events. But the wandering image is a changing image. It changes in the single carrier from birth through growth, blossom, age and death. It changes during the transition to a new carrier, because no one repeats the other mathematically exactly. It changes finally in the millennium age of the genus, because also genera and species are subject to becoming and passing away. Plutarch, a devotee of the Eleusinia, says, No one remains, no one is one. But we become many, in that only the matter drifts around a single image and slips away again. And still Plotinus calls the matter the receiving place of the images. We are, as one notices, at the source of the concept of the nisus formativus. But all that has been said would be in vain if our proof of the self-revelation, also of the organic life and images, were misinterpreted, as if the image were a vis, a physical force. In the great machine house of physics, there is neither room for souls, nor also for images. In the world of causes and forces, there are absolutely no images. But in the world of images, there are a fortiori, a fortiori, In the world of causes and forces there are absolutely no images, but in the world of images there are, a fortiori, no causes and forces. If one wants to compare the metaphysical imprinting power of the images to an effecting, then this would be an effecting of a magic power, which does not move from the outside, but transforms from the inside. Real transformations are physically impossible. To change continuously is the distinguishing mark of all living. Consequently, the life lies outside of the being world of the things in the happening reality of the images.